committee members might have to run off and, and go to another committee there. And I think we will probably pick up a few. I heard another committee is going a little bit long, so we might pick up a few members as, as we uh, go on today. We want to welcome you all. Uh, I am Chairman Walker Thomas. My co-chair is not here yet. He might be in another committee. Uh, he will say a few words, I'm sure, when he gets here. Uh, this is the first uh, meeting of our interim uh, Joint Committee on Veterans, Military Affairs, and Public Protection. We're glad to have so many uh, faces that uh, really support our veterans and, and our first responders and everything out, out in the audience today. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and uh, uh, have roll call. Mr. Secretary, please call roll. Senator Berg. Senator Boswell. Here. Senator Deneen. Here. Senator Harper Angel. Senator Higdon, Here. Senator Meredith, Senator Smith, Senator Westerfield, Senator Williams, Here. Senator Wilson, Here. Representative Blanton, Representative Bojanowski, Here. Representative Bratcher, Representative Dietz, Here. Representative Dossett, Representative Freeland, Here. Representative Fugit, Here. Representative Gooch, Here. Repre Here. Representative Hart, here. Representative Johnson. Here. Representative Cook. Representative Lewis. Representative Maddox. Representative Masseroni. Here. Representative Proctor. Here. Representative Raymer. Representative Sharp. Representative Stalker. Present. Representative Stevenson. Here. Representative Tackett Lafferty. Representative Wesley. Here. Co Chair Girdler. Co Chair Thomas. Present. Did we make a quorum? Yes. All right, we do have a quorum, and as I said, some other members are, are arriving as we speak there. So, all righty, at this time, uh, I have, we are going to do the Pledge of Allegiance, and if you would, remain standing uh, for a prayer, and uh, we'll get started. Let us all pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you today, God, for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for this wonderful day that we have gathered together. And Lord, I just ask you, Lord, to just lead, guide, and direct us, Lord, how you would uh, help us to direct this state. And Lord, not only that, but also to be a blessing to our veterans and all of our military and our public protectors, God. And Lord, we just ask you, Lord, to uh, help our leadership and just let your hand be upon them and lead and guide them, especially coming into this new session Give us the way that you would have us to go. And we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Wesley. Uh, for the members, uh, if, if you haven't served on this committee long, we always honor distinguished guests. Uh, and, oh, here come. Other meeting must be over. <laughs> we'll give them just a sec here. But we always honor our distinguished veterans, first responders, people in your communities that have gone over and beyond the call of duty on uh, different different things. So uh, the senators that are here, we've we've always seemed to have distinguished guests from some of the House members, but seen, seen our uh, centers, we'd love to have y'all's input also. Brian Alvey over in the corner, kind of wave your hand there. A lot of y'all know him and have his phone number, but if you have a distinguished guest in your district or or a military honoree that you'd like to honor, please uh, let Brian know and we'll get him scheduled, especially for this interim. We got six meetings, so we got five more guests we can we can honor there. So that leads up to uh, Representative Masseroni. If you would, you are welcome to go down there with them and bring your guest up. And you're going to bring Cinder in a joint? Well, I called out the Cinders and we have one that's... Uh, <laughs> All right here. And the floor is yours. Please introduce yourselves if you would. Make sure the green mic's on for the record. Thank you. Hi. Representative Candy Masseroni. And this is my guest, uh, Richard Nest. Hello. Give me go ahead and start. Whoops. I, hello again. 
Good to have you, sir. Thank you. Okay, today I want to honor uh, Richard Nest. He is a, a very important member of our community in Nelson County. At the age of 18, uh, Richard went to uh, Vietnam, and within six months, he had boots on the ground in Vietnam of, within joining the military. He served proudly with the, with the 173rd Airborne. Richard has two bronze stars. As a paratrooper, Richard participated in Operation Junction City, which awarded him one of the bronze stars to his jump wings. Uh, Richard has served in uh, served our military and our community in three different ways. First, he was an enlisted soldier. Then he went to be an officer. And for the last 58 years, he has been a, a veteran helping the uh, advocate for the veterans community. He served on uh, in our American Legion post as post commander and many other roles within that. Richard is uh, currently a member of the American Legion Post Mo Kentucky Home, Post 121 in Bardstown. And we just want to thank Richard for his service and everything he does for our communities. Richard also is a very big advocate on with Agent Orange. And he, he focuses his uh, primary attention on Americanism, teaching our youth about, you know, how to honor our flags. So. Well... Well, hi, I guess I want to thank you. It's on. I want to thank you for uh, uh, Candy and, and Jimmy for inviting me. I've only got 20 pages to speak, but I, <laughs> I've, I brought it down to, f to only one. So uh, I'm here today to take my five minutes of fame to thank you, not for this award, but for what you do and can do for Kentucky active duty and veterans. My special thank you for the extra help, uh, for your extra help on the new Bowling Green Veterans Center in Bowling Green. So I, I personally thank you all very, very much for that little bit of help and push on it. Uh, as you know, it's going to create beds for uh, 60 other veterans. It's uh, going to create 120 jobs, so it's a great thing. And I want you all to know that your mission statement for this committee and the mission statement of, for the 501C19's organizations, which is the VFW American Legion uh, Vietnam Veterans Association, we, we all have the same common mission statement, which is to help veterans, and uh, so I appreciate it. Um, my bio listed a lot of what we call bells and whistles, but the big story here should be about you and the committee, so I hope you p please keep up the good work. So I th I'm thanking you in advance, so thank you again. Thank you for your service, sir. Cinder Higdon, do you have anything to add? Just very briefly, I think I uh, want to thank Richard. Thank you for your service to to our country, and thank you for being here today. And I want to thank Representative Masseroni for including me on this today. Thank you. All righty. Well, at this time, if y'all want to come stand up front, do we have someone that can take pictures? Yep, I'm there. Oh, he was hiding from me. Come on around and. Uh, she has just a small token on, on uh, behalf of the Veterans Military Affairs Commission. You want to take your name tag and just hide it? You want to take your lunch? Just hide it behind you. There you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've always <laughs> Thank you. That that thick folder worried us for a sec there. <laughs> we, as we see, you, you uh, we have a pretty robust agenda there. Uh, so at this time, we'll go ahead and get started. We have a report uh, from, and and what you'll see is is we kind of 
have have focused this uh, session more so or, or this meeting more so on veteran suicide and how a lot of these groups can help so uh, that's kind of it but if if it's beyond those scopes you are welcome to talk about that also so let's bring up the Kentucky Department of Veterans Affairs and we have Juan Renaud and Silas Sessions executive directors we appreciate you being here and y'all have probably done this before. Make sure those green lights are on. Introduce yourselves for the record, please. Okay. Hey, good morning. I am uh, Juan Renault. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for the uh, KDVA. Good morning. I'm uh, Silas Session. I'm the Executive Director for the Office of Kentucky Veteran Services at the KDVA. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Uh, first of all, can y'all can you hear me pretty good? Okay. Uh, on behalf of Commissioner Allen, KDVA, and the Governor Challenge Team, we're thankful for the opportunity to share what we're doing to help uh, deter and diminish death by suicides for veterans and non-veterans across the Commonwealth. For several us, for several us veterans and non-veterans, uh, suicide and suicide attempts hit close to home. In particular for me, one of my former soldiers who actually is from Louisville, um, suffers from substance abuse, suicide ideations, uh, PTSD from sexual trauma and combat, uh, discovering one of our soldiers who had been in a unit uh, dead. Uh, and he's been fighting for his life for 10 years. I speak with him at least twice a week. Uh, I, I, I tell him, I'm not going to lose you. I'm not going to give up on you. I'm going to fight with you, and I'm going to fight for you. So, I'm sure if you ask any other members on the Governor Challenge team or any, anyone else, they'll have similar stories to this. And that's why the, Governor Challenge, the mission of the Governor Challenge team is important to us. <clears throat> so if there are no comments, we'll go ahead and get started. This is our agenda. Uh, we will share some unfortunate numbers to frame the problem, discuss the highlights of the Governor Challenge team and, and our KDVA staff, and close with a list of resources that help uh, veterans. You all aware Kentucky has divided into 15 community mental health centers. These centers are postured to help any Kentuckian with various issues. Active duty members can see providers on military installations, but many seek assistance at these centers. They do that because they don't want to disclose their military connection sometimes for fear of stigma uh, that may affect their, their service. The stigma is getting better, but it takes intentionality to continue to improve this. I want you to reference these tables on, on this slide. It provides stats on mental health services from 2011 to 2022. The higher numbers coincide with a nation at war, and that's in the time period of 2011 to 2016. These numbers do not include federal numbers, but nevertheless, throughout the Commonwealth, these mental health centers are currently serving military veterans and uh, military members, excuse me. Next, please. This slide depicts suicides by death as reported by those community mental health centers. And it further breaks out by age, race, and military service between the years of 2017 and 2022. This slide compares veterans on the left and non-veterans on the left, oh, excuse me, on the right, fatal overdoses from the years 2010 to 2015. If you notice the dashed lines, they indicate unstable numbers, which means that the numbers are very small and less likely to capture the true picture of what's happening in those areas. Uh, if you look at the gray, the, uh, gray portions, those are suppressed numbers, and they indicate incidents that are too low uh, to show without identifying who the actual individual is. And there's no areas across the state that doesn't suffer from fatal overdoses. Next, please. It's easy to think of installations such as Fort Knox, Fort Campbell, Bluegrass Army Depot, but there are military members in the National Guard and reserve formations across the state. In 2012, there was a study concluded that National Guard members had been found to have higher rates of suicide ideation and suicidal behaviors post deployments than active duty members. And those numbers at that time were active duty 20.2 per 100,000, reservists were 24 per 100,000, and National Guard was 31 per 100,000. 
There are over 300,000 veterans dispersed across the state, and unfortunately, there is a connection with behavioral health, drug use, overdose, and suicide across the state. This is why the Governor Challenge team, our staff, and, a, and the great work of a plethora of organizations that are connected to the Governor Challenge team is important. The team was established in 2022. After building the initial team, they met period periodically to build strategy, to, make, to take initial steps to address our issues with suicide. Outputs from our planning and collaboration include participation in crisis intervention training, creating a provider directory, conducting employee training, a yellow ribbon, uh, resi excuse me, yellow ribbon resiliency training, and the Purple Star program, just to name a few. <clears throat> August 22, okay. members of the Governor Challenge team, executive team, attended the National uh, Summit in Washington, D.C. It's a great way, it was a great way, excuse me, it was a great way to best see practices, new trends, and meet experts across the spectrum and receive specialized assistance from our national partners. Excuse, I got a little dry, excuse me. <laughs> In March of 23, uh, Executive Director uh, Dr. Sessions and Kentucky National Guard Surgeon Major Tim Olson uh, represented the team at the uh, 2023 National Summit. The Governor Challenge team has been meeting sporadically, but in May, this past May, the team established bi -monthly, a bi-monthly meeting schedule. Next slide, please. During the National Governor Challenge team site visit, our team collectively decided on short-term goals for <clears throat> or short-term goals of military cultural cultural competency training for providers and counseling and access to non-lethal means. Non-lethal means being the highest uh, ranking method of death by suicide. Excuse me, lethal. Thank you. We also developed long-term goals of collaboration with Volunteers of America for safe space branding create statewide virtual summits, engage with firearm retailers who desire to help decrease death by suicide by firearms, and training school-aged children on gun safety. As for the next steps, the team will continue planning our summit and will distribute suicide prevention materials at the upcoming uh, Veterans Experience Action Center on 27 through 29 uh, June next week. And that will be uh, in Louisville. Uh, and partner, they're also going to partner with our, with the uh, KDVA state programs uh, to create a suicide prevention symposium. Next, please. As you, as you can see by this slide, KDVA has been engaged regarding suicide prevention. We've hired key leaders and coordinators focused on wraparound services, wraparound services for veterans. We explain our part. We we have expanded our partnerships with various state agencies and programs. Our way ahead focus on formalizing our partnerships with CHFS, establishing wounded and disabled veterans outreach activities, continue our partnerships with the Kentucky Judicial Commission on Mental Health, and our, our uh, VA Mid-South Healthcare Network monthly meetings with Kentucky and Tennessee commissioners. The next several slides, um, the next three slides are basically uh, resources that are available to assist veterans across the state not just across the state, veterans period, uh, with regard to suicide and suicide prevention. Um, and we can provide additional information on those resources if need be. Uh, but uh, that concludes our, our presentation, uh, subject to your questions. And also, as I uh, mentioned, the, uh, the VIAC meeting on the 27th through the 29th, that's our flyer. And uh, we look to have an outstanding event. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that presentation. Uh, and we have Senator Berg has a maybe a question or so, and we'll open this up to questions if any of y'all have any. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this presentation. You you gave us some data about suicides per 100,000. I think you said about 20 per 100,000 for active duty. 
thirty per one hundred thousand for reservists. Was that it? Uh, uh, Thirty-one for National Guard. National Guard. Yes, ma'am. What is the rate for the general population? What are we comparing it to? Um, th- this study was focused particularly on uh, service members, so, so we don't I, 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 don't, I don't have that data. No matter. Okay, thank you, thank you. All righty, we have uh, Representative Dietz. Good morning. Thank you so much for presenting today. My additional job is a, is a family law attorney, and I represent part of Kenton County, which is in northern Kentucky, so I'm not near Fort Knox and I'm not near Fort Campbell. And I have said for years we don't do enough for our veterans when they return or the whole family. And I still represent veterans or their spouse. So my question is, and I see that you're working with the Kentucky Judicial well, I know with the Kentucky Bar Association, I'm very interested in, in mental health because I see families coming through. Um, and unfortunately, I've had the veteran commit suicide. We've had firearms removed from the house. They still find a way. Um, so I appreciate what you're doing, and I would would wonder if you all are going to be working with the Bar, Associ- Bar Association as well, because as an attorney, sometimes I don't know where to refer them or the spouse that actually sees that they have the problem. Because if you're relying on the veteran to go somewhere, sometimes that doesn't work and you need to have family members step up. Well, yes, ma'am. So we do have our, our internal lawyer uh, and she is engaging in that, in that part in, in helping build uh, those partnerships and that, that, that collaboration. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, uh, Senator Williams. Thank you. I'm looking at page four of the deaths by suicide by CMHC, and, and I want to clarify too is, is that veterans' deaths? Is that all deaths? Are those of those that were served by the previous ones were veterans that were served by CMHC? So, how do those two? slides relate so this one has uh, an aspect of veterans if you look down towards the bottom you'll see ever uh, ever serve no or not stated and yes so yes means the veteran identified as a veteran no not stated we don't know um, but it, it covers the population that those uh, those health centers serviced and okay. they don't just they don't just service veterans they service all of Kentucky so these were actually service not total deaths for the region yes right? sir. those service okay thank you all righty, we have Senator Higdon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just primarily a, a comment. Uh, thank you all for, I'm right here. <laughs> thank you for being here and thank you for your service. And I just want to put a plug in for KDVA and any m- <clears throat> committee member. If you have an issue, a veteran issue, it's a, a Commissioner Allen and his folks do a great job servicing the veterans of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and I want to thank you all for that, and and um, I know you'll keep up the good work, but I just want to make sure that committee members understand if a veteran needs assistance, KDVA is there, and, and they will do, they will take care of the issue, and I want to thank you all for that, and Commissioner Allen, so thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative Scott Sharp. Thank you, Chairman, and I, I would like to echo Senator Higdon's uh, uh, praise of uh, the Kentucky Veterans Association. Uh, I've got something currently going through, and they've helped me a lot. Uh, but my question to you, gentlemen, is you, you mentioned the suicide rate between the National Guard and Reserve or the uh, National Guard and Active Duty. What was that? During this, you, you talk referencing the study, uh, 2012 study. So the, the National Guard rate was uh, 31 per 100,000 as a result of that study. The reserves was 24 per 100,000, and active duty was 20.2 per 100,000. My, my question is, have you identified the reason, the, the difference between that? I, I can't. Why is there, uh, you know, it looks like about a third between uh, 33% increase with the National Guard versus active duty. I, I, I'm not going to speculate. I'll see if Dr. Sessions may have some uh, additional insight to that. So that's a that's a very uh, uh, good good question. Um, the study that was 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 referenced didn't give all of the details of the why. The purpose of the study was to show that the National Guard was having more suicides than even the active active duty. So that that was the purpose of it. Um, some of the reasons um, um, could be 
uh, National Guard, um, National Guard deployed just like active duty, but they also handle natural disasters, and they also have to they have to have their their job at home and their military. So there there are some issues uh, that they have to deal with that's different than some of the other components um, when it comes to active versus reserve. But the purpose of that study is to show the difference, not why there was a difference. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, we've got a couple more questions. Uh, Representative Bratcher. Thank you very much for bringing this this to our attention today. Um, with me being a Nash, presently serving National Guard member, I think I could speak on some of these issues. But it's a serious issue. Unfortunately, in our unit, in our National Guard unit this past year, we had two suicides. One of them was uh, in my direct unit. So he was a seasoned uh, combat veteran, and he had – tremendous amount of experience in, in the field and, and, and off, off the field. But um, unfortunately, we didn't recognize the red flags early enough to stop it. So that this hits really home to me. And then you, you mentioned that the, and there's been questions of well, why National Guard is uh, a more serious or a higher level of incident is because we get called out for things such as um, flooding and hazard. We get called out for tornadoes. Um, and they're searching through rubble to find cadavers. Um, they're rescuing people from floods. Then you get um, um, spit on when you're doing um, um, riots in downtown Louisville. And then you do COVID relief efforts, and you see people suffering there. And then you get activated for that stateside, and then you come back and you're at your desk at work two days later. And they're saying, well, I thought you were one week in a month. You know, why are you gone so much? Why are you gone so so often, so you have that pressure from work as well. Then you get activated for a, for going to um, Africa. Are we in Africa? I didn't know we we're in Africa. So we, you're 30 days there. Then you're back at work after you've been in a combat situation. So all this, we're relying more and more on the National Guard to do a lot of um, federal and state requirements. I don't think that um, people realize the challenges that it takes on your you personally. So that's why you probably see a difference in the amount of increase in suicides in National Guard than you do reserve and active duty. Furthermore, we um, see more suicides, more deaths in the military in general by suicide than we do combat or accidents. So it is an alarming, alarming issue. So um, just keep that in mind as, a, as you go forward and you think about um, veterans benefits and, and National Guard benefits, you know, people, it's, it's more than just one week in a month, you know, especially this past couple of years with COVID and flooding all the things we've seen, and then, you're, then you've got the federal stuff that you're working on too. So, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And then also, the other thing I think is that sometimes veterans don't know where to go get service. They're afraid that, you know, you're not covered. If you're in, on active duty status, you're covered from active duty standpoint. Then you come off active duty status, and then you, if you don't have insurance, how are you covered? You know, so I think for mental health purposes, that, that anywhere in the state that you should be able to walk into a facility whether it's a hospital, mental health, or um, a licensed social worker, whoever, even an attorney, and get help and it not, not worry about how it's going to be covered or paid for. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. We've got one more question. Senator Boswell. Uh, thank you for being here. I, I want to follow up on uh, something Senator Berg said, and I, would, I think that maybe at some point in the future, Oh, you could get those numbers for us. I think it's important for us as we look at these numbers to see how these numbers do compare to the general population. A certain amount of people in our country are going to get cancer. A certain amount, unfortunately, it's a terrible tragedy. A certain percent of the people in our country, especially after COVID, are committing suicide. And we need to, to obviously try to do what we can to help all this population. So I think it would be helpful going to, for me personally going in the future to know how this, these numbers compare to the general population. Second thing is, um, I, I'm new on this committee, so I, I guess I'm a little interested in, is, is a federal government who, they are the general, the, the, I think, in the employer of all the veterans. Are they failing to do these things? Is that why we are, are having to implement all these programs here in the state of Kentucky? Is a federal government failing to provide these services for the veterans? And so I guess I'm, I'm needing to understand a little bit just a quick um, sentence or two about why is it that Kentucky uh, is having to do these things versus the employer? 
Well, uh, sir, the, the the federal government, the federal VA, they they have these types of programs as well. So the attempt is to to provide the services, the mental health services for the veterans, uh, for all veterans. Uh, so that effort is there to to speak on why it's 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 a growing problem. That's that's beyond my scope. Uh, I know we're trying to do everything we can to help mitigate this, not just for veterans. This team is not just for veterans, but it also is focused on all Kentuckians, the, the, the Governor Challenge team. But uh, honestly, I can't give you a real, a real good explanation for that, sir. Thank you. General Bullard, you might have some insight, and I know you're going to be speaking in a bit, but glad to see you're up and about and better. Thank you so <laughs> much. I had COVID recently, so... <laughs> Still, go go still ahead trying. and in, introduce yourself again just one more time. If Hi, that's uh, Brigadier General Retired Steve Bullard. And uh, first off, Center for Disease Control, latest statistics, 2021. They had their largest increase ever in national suicides U.S. in 2021. It's 14.1 per 100,000, so significantly lower. And we dealt with this, of course, I was chief staff of the Kentucky National Guard, and this has been very, very important to us. Representative Bratcher hit it right on the head. When a guardsman or reservist comes back, you're, you're active duty, you're at Fort Campbell, you're Fort Knox, you're in a cocoon, and you're constantly with those who came back. It's like PTSD when you came back from World War II or Korea, you probably came back on a troop ship surrounded by friends to talk it out for a month. Now you come back, you jump on an airplane, and you're back. I was I went from com uh, commanding a combat squadron and during Iraqi freedom to being with my family at Walt Disney World 48 hours later, and it was the single worst experience I ever went through in my entire life. Uh, I can't tell you how terrible it was for me. But the uh, uh, we, you come back as a guardsman, and we know this. We try, we try, we try, but you're released back into your community, and it may be hundreds of miles away, states away, and you're not in that cocoon any longer, and you're with people who just don't understand. And it's so difficult to control. And I think of Brian Allah. You remember Brian? Uh, we lost him, and we 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 recognized the signs. We got him committed for 72 hours, and they released him. They said, "Okay, he's good." He goes straight home, commits suicide in front of his parents. Uh, uh, it's uh, it, it is such a challenge for us. It is really difficult for us to get our hands around. So we are working and working and working. And really appreciate the governor's challenge and KDVA. So I, I just want to make those points. Thank you, General. Uh, we do have one more quick question. Uh, Vice Chair, or I'm sorry, Vice Chair, yeah, Deneen, go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you for these uh, uh, alarming statistics. Um, would you agree that um, um, timely access to care yeah. is, is crucial? Yes. Uh, and I, I bring that question for a reason. I served the 10th district uh, around Fort Knox. Um, you know, we've lost uh, our Army Hospital there and, and we're now VA clinics and, and, and we're more of a clinical setting. Um, I, I hear from our veterans quite often um, um, timely access to, to care sometimes is difficult. Um, getting care outside of the VA clinic um, in their um, own communities is sometimes a, a, a monumental task um, to get um, to be put through phone trees and hundreds and hundreds of you know minutes and time on phones trying to get an appointment set. Um, when I've heard those things from our veterans, um, I, I they raise red flag on protocols uh, of the current VA clinics on making sure that our veterans not only get their appointments set, but also when they are seen um, in those clinics, they have a, a, a debriefing or an exit meeting with uh, a registrar or somebody there that can ensure they know when their next meeting is and appointment is, where their prescriptions are, are coming from. I, I see um, as a son of a veteran and my father going through this process, it was, it was highlighted with me um, dealing with some of his health care issues. Um, so it is very important that uh, I would like to know, as the Kentucky Department of Veteran Affairs, if you all have any sway with the protocols that are within our VA clinics that may assist many of our older veterans, our, our Vietnam veterans that 
um, are being referred to apps and websites. And, uh, well, quite frankly, sir, that's not, uh, 84-year-old's not going to go to an app. And I, I think they, they really need um, the help they need. Um, and I think just as we have soldiers come back in our National Guard and, and our active duty, they come back from a mission. They have a debriefing. What went on? What next steps are? Sometimes I see in our VA clinics that that exit meeting doesn't happen. And they're left out there to kind of wonder when their next appointment is, where to go, where their uh, prescriptions coming from, um, whether or not they can meet at their local hospital, regional health care provider. Um, so they're, they're, they're struggling with that transfer, I guess, into community care and settings. And I'm just wondering, does your department have any sway in improving those communication lines and, and those protocols within our VA clinics to assist the veterans get the very help they need in a timely manner that may help avoid some of these suicides? Well, uh, again, I concur. This 54-year-old doesn't like using the apps himself. So uh, um, uh, as far as sway with, with the, uh, the clinics, uh, we, don't, we can't tell them how to operate. We can actually engage them or, or ask the question uh, to help, uh, you know, try to improve processes. As uh, Dr. Session and I both live in the Fort Knox area, so we're well aware of, of the challenges you know, using some of the healthcare facilities there, especially after Ireland was uh, was closed down. Uh, and and as a recently retiree, I can speak to a portion of of, of uh, processes that I've encountered going through uh, the healthcare system. So when I get an appointment with the VA and I go through that appointment, I do get a checkout and I do get the next appointment. And if I have a prescription, that provider is telling me your prescription will be mailed to you, and here's the information for it. So that is given to you. So those processes are improving. Uh, we have miles to go before we sleep on that one, but they are improving. Well, I thank you for that, uh, for that response. Um, I would like to see those in, in more in action, and, and I do see those improvements being made, um, just not on a consistent basis. We have a lot of um, folks that are caring for our veterans in these VA clinics that have hearts of gold and their hearts are in the right place, and it's not the care providers that, that are struggling. It's sometimes the simple step of a protocol or a procedure that might help those veterans get where they need to be and, and to follow through with, uh, with any recommendations for assistance. So I'd encourage you to continue to have those conversations with those VA clinics on protocols and procedures, especially exit meetings with patients to ensure that some of our older veterans understand when their meetings are and, and, and where they need to go. So I thank you for your service and I thank you for what you all are doing. Um, I think we're making steps in the right direction and, and I'm encouraged by um, hearing further on ways we can reduce the suicides. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's a good segue saying that we're getting ready to hear some further uh, other presenters here in a sec. So if we could, I'm going to go ahead and acknowledge y'all's two uh, questions, but let's stop there because some of these other groups that are trying to help our veteran suicide might be able to answer some of your questions. Hang tough, uh, Representative Stalker, if you would, and then Senator Berg, and we're going to hold it because we have a pretty full agenda and we want to make sure we have time for everyone. Uh, thank you for your presentation. These numbers and everything about the way we support and don't support our veterans is disturbing um, and unacceptable. What I'm curious about is, are you aware of any programs um, within the state or outside of Kentucky models where we perhaps provide a, almost a residential or a reentry program to individuals who are coming back from active service or to Representative Bratcher's um, comments, which make 100% sense when you are constantly um, being pulled in 30 different directions and you're, and you're always on. Um, it's not helpful for veterans to be able to, to be put right back into civilian life and to kind of check that baggage at the door. Are you aware of any programs where folks can be there for a significant amount of time or a short amount of time to really make sure that they have ad addressed and, and to be able to transition back properly into assess mental health? So uh, our guardsmen and women are, are, are unique. 
very, very unique in, in, in re respect to their mission sets. Uh, typically, you have a reception and reintegration process that most soldiers, uh, most service members, I'll say, will go through upon a redeployment or upon coming off of some type of mission. And that helps them reintegrate back into the units, back into their home setting. Again, that uniqueness with, with the guard's mission having to get pulled out, sometimes you don't get that, that opportunity to have a, in place a reception and reintegration piece, uh, which should, should technically be there. At one time, we had the Warrior Transitions Battalions that were placed across the one at Fort Knox, was, uh, did it often, and you would come back into there. And a lot of times it was just if something was wrong with the, the individual soldier, they would come through that process. But we had, we used, there were things at one time in place. Again, the reception and reintegration piece uh, is a little bit more difficult for our guards, men and women. But I'll also defer to Dr. Sessions, and he may have some other pieces on this. Uh, it's a very, very important question. Um, there are a lot of different models of different um, states that we've been able to see where they're helping, but it's more reactive to the problem set like we're talking about. Um, now, the as far as the federal military, we all have to, after every deployment, I mean, it's it's mandatory. The, the, the reintegration process is, is, is set and there is multiple gates for mental health checks and things like that. There's questionnaires, there's you, you meet with a provider and things like that. However, um, to connect to, uh, well, I'll just, I'll just stay here. Part of the issue is what, what, what is the soldier's mind, what is the military member's mindset? If they are not fully open and sharing what the issues are, it doesn't matter how good the program is. So part of it is we have to, as a, as a, as a team, federal, state, all of you leaders, all of us, we have to work together to let these individuals know when you do get to these interviews or get to this, uh, this, this actual appointment, you have to be um, open and, 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 and honest to help. So the, the, the federal uh, process from returning to, um, from a deployment is a good process. The question is, how am I as a soldier? How how is the other military? How's the military member going through the process? So there there are things that are that are already done that that can help. But and, and in addition to your question, there are other um, organizations that provide um, um, programs that that can help give additional assistance. All righty. Uh, last but not least, uh, Senator Berg. Thank you. Um, you know, I've I've worked in the the veterans hospital for for many many years, and I'm used to patients having like a service related like ten percent, twenty percent, thirty percent, and that sort of um, has you know significant implement implications as to what services they're eligible for and what they're not. For mental health, do we have anything like that, or are people just assumed? a hundred percent covered or where are we I'm, I'm not sure if i understand the question but if you have a retired military person who has no service related disabilities they have you know can they still go to the va system and get mental health care at no cost yes yes they, they, have, to, they, have, they have to register to uh uh obtain a, a, a primary care provider, and then once you go through that process and you start identifying issues, then that's how you work through that piece. So 100%, even if you have no service-related so, disabilities. So veterans, veterans that retire, um, they have, yes, they have a, a 100% um, 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 coverage for that. That's veterans that retire. Veterans that separate Unless, and this, I think this gets to your question, unless they have a service-connected um, issue, um, they do not have full, full coverage. However, with the, the new Compact Act, um, when it comes to uh, some of the issues we're talking about, suicide ideation, things like that, the, the, the federal government has underwritten all the costs. So it doesn't matter what, 
even if you're other than honorable, if you have an issue that's if you have an issue, if you go to the hospital for something like this, the federal government um, underwrites that in accordance to the the new uh, Compact Act. And do you so, think your veterans know that that they have I, access? I didn't. I found out at the last. Con I did not know. So I'm pushing. We're, we're trying to push it, and that's why it's in, it's in your resources. You have it in the packet. I did not know that, and I was tickle pink when I heard when I heard that. So people need people need to know that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And that's what we're doing. We're, we're we're trying to push that information out with our with our conferences for women's veterans, our state conferences, training the veteran service organizations with this partnership with the VA for the uh, Veterans Experience Action Center. We're trying to connect to our veterans and, and, and get that information out to them. Uh, and you know, obviously our hardest part is our veterans in the rural communities, but we're working that as well. Gentlemen, thank you so much. That was uh, very informative and invoked a lot of discussion, as you can tell there. And, and we really appreciate y'all being here and all the look forward to seeing you the end of August, too. I believe y'all have something over in Lexington and, yes. and look forward to coming over and visiting with y'all. Uh, we'll let y'all go ahead. And while we're put, bringing up the, another, the next presenter, uh, Representative Masseroni had a few guests in the audience. While they're still here, I wanted to give her a chance to uh, recognize them. And USA Cares, if y'all want to take the table, Matt. Yes, I wanted to welcome Matthew and Kristen Cooper and Dixie Smith as well as Richard Ness today. So thank you. Great. Thank well, we you. wanted to make sure they were still here, and we, we appreciate it and everything. So all righty. Logan is loading up a new slide presentation. And uh, Matt, if y'all would, just go down the table and, and introduce yourselves for the record. Make sure those green lights are on those uh, speakers there microphones there we are yes sir uh, my name is Matt Castor I'm the vice president of government and corporate relations for USA cares Bill Dariff former mayor of the city of Jefferson town former president of KLC but today I am a board member of USA cares representing them uh, mr. chairman and uh, members of the committee it's really an honor to be here on behalf of USA cares um, I appreciate everyone who's here today uh, who's who's concerned with this issue um, it, it's, it, it's something that's not a, a military issue. It's not a veteran issue. It's an American issue and, uh, something that everybody in this room can appreciate. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about USA cares and the work that we're doing. We are a, a national 501 C three that is headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we work in all 50 States and, uh, have so for the past 20 years. So starting in Radcliffe, um, our organization started as a service for uh, veterans coming back from uh, the war in Iraq in 2003. And in many cases, we were assisting veterans who were coming back with physical injuries, uh, coming back missing limbs, coming back with traumatic injuries um, that were going to make the rest of their life a challenge. And we wanted to step in and financially support those families and help in any way we can. As you know, as we progress through the years, uh, over the last 20 years, those needs have transitioned, and we deal now with more of the invisible injuries of post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. And as we do that, uh, we've realized a few things. Uh, we've realized that um, we can step in with some of these families who are coming to us, and we, can, we may not be able to stop a, a suicide directly, but we may be able to eliminate the factors that push somebody to make that type of terrible decision. We are going to hear a lot today uh, in our discussion about this number of 22 veterans a day, and we can debate the number and the validity of that number. Uh, some say it's much higher, some say it's much, much lower. Uh, I think we can all agree, though, it's too many, regardless of what the number is. Um, at USA Cares, we are receiving right now uh, more than 100 calls each week from veteran families who are at rock bottom. These are men and women who served our country, who feel as though they don't have anywhere else to turn. They don't know what to do. And in many cases, by the time they come to USA Cares, they have been referred to us by two, three, sometimes four other organizations or services who have not been able to provide help. Our main mission is dealing with this idea of transition and dealing with this idea of 
somebody losing their sense of purpose or feeling like their life is out of control. Um, I, I appreciated the example given earlier uh, by Mr. Bullard uh, about coming back from, from a combat situation and being in Disney World 48 hours later. That is a story, a common theme that we hear through many people um, and one that uh, we try to address and try to help them transition. And that trans transition isn't just preparation for the veteran themselves. In many cases, that is where we as an organization need to work with employers as well and help employers understand when they, everybody wants to hire veterans, but when they go to hire a veteran, do they understand what that means? Do they understand building a community, building camaraderie within their workplace to support that veteran? And so we try to hit it from, from both sides. A statistic that struck me, and I, I think you all will appreciate, in the 20 years of combat uh, since September 11th, uh, we've lost more than 7,000 men and women to service-connected uh, uh, casualties. And we've lost more than 30,000 to suicide. Now, again, that number can be debated, but um, roughly four times the number of people have committed suicide than have been lost in combat. And, and that is something that um, keeps me up at night, and I'm sure it does you as well. Uh, it's, it's something that we can do something about collectively, and uh, we hope to do so. In the last 10 years, um, the, the biggest area that we've been able to step in and help pull people back from the brink is housing. Um, we have stopped more than 4,500 veteran families from being evicted from their homes or being removed from their, their rental property because we recognize the fact that when somebody loses their home and they lose that place of stability, the likelihood of suicide increases dramatically. Add into that uh, something like having their car repossessed. Now all of a sudden they're unable to get their kids to school. They're unable to get to work. Their job is in jeopardy and that downward spiral begins. These are all triggers. These are all have a direct and profound impact on these families that if we don't address those particular issues, then this, this rate will continue. So we are gonna continue to take on the issue of housing. We're gonna continue to take on the, the, the job placement uh, program. Uh, we have a, a wonderful partnership with Fort Knox and a senior leader career transition program where we have a, an, an eight week program um, where we can place senior leaders with companies they are still paid by the Department of Defense during that eight-week period. They're being evaluated by the company. The company is evaluating them, and it's a way to more slowly transition into a career to find out if it is a good fit or if it is not. But it's, it's, what we're finding is it's, it's allowing the employers to be trained as well as the veteran to more slowly ease into a, a permanent position that's going to give them that sense of fulfillment. The other side of this, let me mention one other thing on this slide. Um, I am someone who uh, largely has not been in nonprofit. Nonprofit for me is in the last four years. And one of my biggest frustrations with, with nonprofit is the fact that everybody is so focused, hyper-focused on a functional allocation. That is to say how much of the money goes towards the mission. It is, it is important. It is important for credibility purposes. And USA Cares is at 87% of our money goes directly towards the mission, and that's wonderful. But it does hinder our ability to promote our services, and it does hinder our ability to conduct uh, everything we need to. Um, so that's difficult, and it, it, it causes us to need to come and ask for assistance from the state of Kentucky to, to get some additional resources in order for us to continue uh, this mission completely. USA Cares, as I mentioned, is working in all 50 states. Um, we have started the process uh, in the last few years of opening chapters. Uh, we have 38 chapters active across the country. And this model um, is proving effective in a couple different ways. One, it is raising support. It's raising financial support for USA Cares to be able to assist more veteran families. But it's also creating those community groups. It's creating ways for veterans to get together. I'm sure anybody in any of the, the, the groups that are here today present 
would tell you if you can get veterans together and getting them talking, there's healing that takes place there. And we want that to be the case with each one of these chapters around the country. So we'll continue to open up more and to hold events, um, to, to get people together, to get people talking, and to bring more and more awareness to the issue of veteran suicide. This is a, a question I get quite often from just about anyone I speak to. They'll tell me, hey, I've never heard of USA Cares. Well, there's a reason, because we don't advertise. We spend no money on advertising. We spend, spend no money on promotion. And the people who do hear of, from us are referred to us by other services. These numbers you see on the screen were last year alone, and the numbers of veteran families referred to us by these services, in many cases with no funding to follow. On average, it costs us about $4,000 per family to fully assist them, to fully keep them in their home. Anybody in this room who's good at math can go through these numbers and realize there's no way I can financially cover the need of all these, organiz all these people. Um, these represent uh, men and women. These represent children. Uh, these, are, these are families. And uh, we're going to do everything we can to, to, to protect them. But we also need to reach out to every one of these organizations and say, we, we are honored that you believe in us enough to send us veterans to assist, but we also need you to come alongside us and help us fund these. So our, our, what we're seeing in, in Kentucky alone, um, last year we had 224 uh, immediate needs for assistance here, uh, which reflects about $896,000 uh, at that average of $4,000 per family. Uh, the resources simply aren't there. Uh, unless we can, we can promote, unless we can somehow uh, reach out and, and, and do more, uh, there, there's just not enough uh, resources to help everybody, uh, at least help everyone completely. We may be able to make sure they've got food, we may be able to do partial relief, but, uh, but not the complete relief that we, we are looking for. Um, and that is our ask uh, of all of you, is to consider um, not only USA Cares, but these other great organizations you're going to hear from as well. Help fund these organizations. Let's put some money into these. The work that we're doing, um, not to disparage anything that the government does, but the work we, we are doing can often be done much faster and at a, a much lower uh, amount of money than, than any government entity can do it. And uh, I, I'm, I'm proud of the work that we're doing. I'm proud of the work that the, the, the men and women who are behind me are doing. And uh, I just, I encourage you strongly to, to give them uh, support uh, as well as USA Cares. We have been uh, recognized uh, over the last several years um, between Newsweek um, listing us as one of eight uh, veteran service nonprofits that, that arose out of the, the tragedy of September 11th um, that is still worthy of your donations today. Uh, we've been named Nonprofit of the Year uh, in Louisville. Um, Charity Navigator has given us their highest rating, uh, and we've been rec recognized for programs we have with Hardee's and Carl's Jr. nationally uh, on Fox News on multiple occasions. Simply put, we need your help. Uh, we are, we, we are uh, looking at the highest number of veterans coming to us this year than we've ever had in 20 years. <clears throat> and we're looking at, with the economic situation, it costing us more and more for every one of these families that we assist. Um, so I, I appreciate your time today. I appreciate you listening and uh, be happy to answer any questions. Or Bill, if you have anything you'd like to add. Yeah. The, um, across the state, USA Cares is their corporate headquarters is in Jefferson Town or Metro Louisville. They stayed here because this is their state and this is where they began and Knox is where they started. We moved them to Jefferson Town in order to get a wider girth. Suicide amongst everybody right now is growing tremendously. I don't have to tell you all that. We're coming out of COVID. We're coming out of being in the basement, not knowing what to do. And our vets are ones that are absolutely need our help. They fought for our freedom. They put their lives on the line. It's time we put the money to help them to make sure they come back. How many times do we have the honor when a person, a man, a woman dies overseas protecting our freedom? But what about those who have passed away for suicide for protecting our freedom? It's time that we put the money up 
to let somebody like USA Cares or one of these organizations, I can contest to them because I'm the one that got them to come to Jefferson Town because I firmly believe in them. And I've seen them grow as a national organization. And the biggest thing I can say is they are there to help everybody they can. They don't have an app. They have a person that answers the phone that says we are here to help. They want to help every single person, and they will take the money you're going to give them and make sure it's put to good use. We do not know the number that we saved that do not commit suicide. We only know the number that we did not reach in time because of suicide. So by having a live person answer the phone and have the resources, whether it's rent, whether it's a uh, ability to help them from becoming su uh, suicidal, or whether it's an education to get a job, or whether it's simply to help them make a car payment, or simply to have somebody to talk to. If anybody's been through a suicide attempt or a person talking to them, they realize many times that person needs a person on the other end of the phone to talk to, a connectivity, somebody that cares. I can tell you with the years I've worked with USA Cares for the last 11 years, they care. And we ask for your help in order to make this state the example of what we believe in our veterans. Thank you all for hearing us today. Thank you, gentlemen. We do have a few questions, and sure. y'all have already, we, we met with Chairman Petrie. He is aware of the need and everything. Thank you. Uh, but where the committee can help as, as the budget process takes place over the next, well, session for, for the biennial budget, uh, you know, doesn't matter, it doesn't hurt to have a casual mention of it or anything that's important to us as, as the budget is uh, taking place. So. Uh, we, unfortunately, at this committee, we don't have that ability to do that, but uh, we we know you've been speaking with the right people, too. So Thank you. Uh, Representative Bojanowski. Yes, thank you. What an honor to have such an impactful organization in my city of Louisville um, and in J-Town, where I grew up. Um, so my question is about families and helping families to know what to do um, to support their family members. I'm a teacher mm -hmm. and I did a full day suicide prevention training and I learned, you know, you ask the questions, are you suicidal? You look for the red flags, like are you giving away things? Do you have any sort of programming to help families understand um, what they can do, what they can ask? Um, you know, there are some pretty set good programs available. Um, yeah. Maybe if not, that would be a great thing to do for your families. Um, just play. Sure. Well, I appreciate your question. Um, I, w we have a, a team of case managers who are, who are well trained and have done this for many years to address a multitude of issues. What I'm most proud about them is probably their humility to be able to say sometimes we're the right organization to help you, and sometimes there are others who are better at it. And so in the case of they can assess the situation very quickly and determine, okay, is this something that we can address right now? Or is this something maybe that a, a professional at the, at the VA is going to be a little better uh, for? So um, I like to think of them as that first, that first line of contact to um, kind of triage the situation and then, and then move them through. Um, so they, they ask the questions that you mentioned they go through and, and assess that and try to determine the immediate need. I hope that answers your question. All righty, uh, Representative Raymer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And really, I have more of a comment than a question, but I recently got to visit their headquarters at USA Cares, spend some time with them, and I was very impressed with the facility. I got to hear some audio recordings of individuals that they had helped and the impact that they're having on these families in Kentucky is huge. Um, and, you know, like he said, these are circumstances that are triggers for these families. So they might not be involved in the actual mental health portion, but intervening and stopping those triggers that put somebody at risk is a great way that we can affect change in this population in Kentucky. And I would just encourage the committee members to um, support this organization. And if you have time, I'm sure they would love for you to pay them a visit. I'd, I'd have to say also that USA Cares is located in J-Town and Metro Louisville, but we represent all those in need across the whole state. Every county, every city 
has a veteran that is in this need, and USA Cares will help them. All right, thank you. Uh, Senator Harper Angel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You touched on my question a little bit, but I'd like to elaborate. Uh, the budget subcommittees, the review budget subcommittees are meeting now, and it would really be helpful if we knew your ask. Yes. I, I'm appreciative of the fact that you're meeting with Representative Petrie and you're on on the job, but it would be helpful to know what, it, you, ne what you need in terms of budget request. And I'm happy to, to send that to everyone uh, on this committee today. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. And uh, Representative Johnson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is not a question either. It's just a little bit of an echo. Um, I stumbled across you guys uh, like seven years ago, went to one of your events, totally impressed. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate what you're doing. And uh, I would just echo that I will be speaking with the A&R chairman as well, uh, seeing what we can do to get you guys some help. And uh, I would also say that I, I'd like to get some contact information from you after we finish this meeting so that I can introduce you, connect you with some people in the Davis County area where I'm from and uh, have you yeah. talk with them one-on-one. -on -one. So I would appreciate that. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for your work. All right. And uh, Representative Tackett Lafferty. I want to begin by saying thank you for all the help that you provide to our veterans. Um, I think that we all have, we all see um, the trouble that our veterans face in our community. Recently in Eastern Kentucky, um, you know, many of our homes were flooded. Um, I heard from some folks who were capable of reaching out to veteran services organizations, uh, in, in, such as your own as well, yeah. um, for help in situations where they didn't have enough money to repair the flood damage, but then something else happened um, and, and they were going to be out expenses and your organizations were able to help to keep those folks mm -hmm. in their homes. I do have a question though. Um, is there some sort of avenue in Kentucky, I'm not sure if you point veterans in that direction but is is there some sort of maybe tax exemption that we give to veterans on their primary residences to try to protect against homelessness do you know that one uh, not at this time that i am aware of okay. uh you know we have the if you become a certain age uh we have other just but at one time there was a push to try to get that through the legislation mm -hmm. And, it, and I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, you all are here more than I am. Okay. I, I don't think we've got it through. Right. Um, well, I, I just wanted to make a, a point that that's a, that's a great idea. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure who filed that bill here, um, but I'm pretty sure I've co-sponsored that bill before. Um, um, but also, um, I just want to say that, you know, for instance, those property taxes or other things that impede these veterans from being able to make repairs to their homes. You know, a, yeah. a specific situation in our group, we ha I had a veteran. His basement was flooded which took out his entire heating and cooling system. Mm. So he has to use the money that he saved to repair his roof on on repairing the flood and of course you have to pay the taxes cuz you don't want, you know, the you know, the home to go into default. So, um, I just wanted to make that point and thank you very much for all the help that you offer. Thank you. All right, Representative Stocker couple questions around the statistics that you shared regarding the amount of applications that you get as well mm -hmm. as the kind of average of $4,000 per family that's needed. Do you all have any uh, data that you're able to collect on the families or individuals that you have to turn away due to lack of funding? It's, uh, we do, we do. Um, I, I think we can look at it from a couple different standpoints. It, it's not quite as black and white because um, they will they will receive assistance in some capacity. So uh, there are very few uh, all out rejections. In many cases, unfortunately, there's some some fraudulent ap applications of people who aren't even veterans who try to receive funding. Uh, we have to sift through a lot of um, a lot of other issues uh, of people trying to to get money. So those are all considered in those. Um, those rejections, but um, I can get you the the data, um, Representative Stalker, as far as the number um, that are coming in versus what we can afford. I can tell you to fully uh, assist that that four thousand dollar number. 
to be able to help everybody uh, that would be coming to me, I would be rejecting over 80% of them because we would need to be a $20 million organization in order to meet the, the current need nationally. That's what I was looking for. Thank you for that. That's You're incredibly welcome. helpful. And then do you, do you have any limitations as far as the assistance that you can give times that you can provide that assistance? I know frequently sure. with food banks, for example, uh, you know, once a month or, you know, there's limitations. Do you guys have any restrictions like that? So initially we offer them a one time, what we call a one time assistance, but we will allow them to reapply. And we don't want it to be so cold and black and white that say, we're only going to help you once and then you're out. But in many cases, we also don't want to be an organization that um, allows somebody to not get back on their own feet. So we want to assist once and get them going. There are special circumstances where people do need further assistance, and we will come back and help them again. But it's all on a case-by-case basis. Okay, and then I just would like to close with a comment. So my background's in the nonprofit uh, sector, and I really appreciated the fact that you started uh, your comments off with the amount of money that goes to actually serving, right, the individuals in the mission. And I think it's important for, for individuals to understand that it costs money to employ yes highly compassionate, uh, skilled, intelligent people to do this work because as somebody who's worked in the nonprofit sector for years, you're competing with the for-profit sector for right. talent. And that's just a game you're always going to lose. So yeah. um, I just appreciate that fact and, and would encourage folks on in this room and, and on this committee in mind. Thank, thank you. you. Gentlemen, thank you so much for, for being here. We appreciate your... Uh, a testimony and, and letting us know about the program and uh, hopefully you'll have a lot of advocates for it as budget surprise there. Wonderful. So thank you appreciate you being here. All right. Next on our list is Project Die Hard, Brian Gibson. And I believe there's another oh come on up. <clears throat> Introduce yourself and for the record there and Logan's gonna reload. It looks like you might have a few slides too then so Uh, my name is Brian Gibson. I am the founder and president of Project Die Hard. Before I go into the slide deck, I'm going to show you what you're going to be helping with. Project Die Hard would like to welcome you to Forward Operating Base Rush in beautiful McCann, Illinois. A lush is 20 acre piece of property with a 10,000 square foot building that once remodeled will house up to 12 veterans and their families to help them get back on their feet. Folks, this is where your $22 a month is going. Right here in the corner, you're going to see where the Veterans Ranch will have a four-stall barn and provide equine therapy services to veterans and families staying at Forward Operating Base Rush. Around the pond, there will also be a playground, a generic classroom, a gym, and a pavilion where you can just relax and enjoy the beautiful scenery. Behind the pond are trails. There will be a retreat center that can hold up to 24 people for a weekend event. So if you would like to bring your veteran nonprofit out to Forward Operating Base Rush, we just ask that you do not charge the folks staying here for any services that you provide. Here's another beautiful overview of what you'll see when you come in to forward operating base rush. Whether you wanna ride some horses, drop a line into the pond and catch some bass and bluegill, or just relax under the pavilion and enjoy the scenery and alleviate some stress that you might be having in your life. Project Die Hard and forward operating base rush are here to provide those services for you and we'll be here as long as you need. We thank you for your time. God bless. Uh, I'm going to premise this right off the bat. You didn't donate 20 acres in a 10,000 square foot building, but we're building one in every state. But our national headquarters is in Paducah, Kentucky. And I'm adamant that Western Kentucky needs Fort Hope that'll house 100 veterans. Let me get to it. 
Uh, Representative Thomas, esteemed members of this committee, thank you for giving me the time to share this mission, to bring public awareness to veteran suicide and to assist in coping with the stresses and difficulties in transitioning to civilian life. We're here to bring them hope. As you know, veteran suicide rate is unacceptable. As of the last census, 6.4% of the population are veterans. But the suicide rate for a veteran is 1.5 times higher than the general population. The rate among veterans between 18 and 34 years old, these are the guys that went into Afghanistan and stuff, has increased by 95.3%. This is just totally unacceptable. How many veterans have to go to the VA seeking help to end up in the parking lot and losing the fight to the demons? I have been asked many times, what causes veterans to take their own lives? If I knew that answer, I wouldn't be here today. Arrows. Before starting Project Die Hard while still serving on active duty, I was a functional alcoholic. I hit a dark point with dealing with my wounded warrior son and receiving the news that one of my brothers was killed in action. It came to the point where I almost became one of these statistics. But by God in a phone call, I sit here before you today. That phone call came from a veteran who needed help. I guess it was the army medic in me that said, got you brother, I got your six that led me down to a pink building in Paducah, Kentucky, the old Finkel building for anybody from around there. And this is where I know God has a sense of humor because he started a biker church in a pink building. With the support of my wife, the church, at God's mercy, I overcame the demon of alcohol and enlisted into God's army. I make no bounds about it. I'm a soldier in God's army trying to help my brothers and sisters. In 2017, I retired from the army, and I did more volunteering with the church, all while waiting for the VA to determine if the 10 pounds of metal in my back was service-related. That took over a year and a half. A year and a half. When I bet you if you pull it out, you'll see the army serial number on it. Being in limbo, I had to do something, right? So I started to work on a tribute bike with the plan to ride it coast to coast because me and some of my brothers that were KIA had that plan when we got back. I'm working with two of my brothers when I get a phone call from the wife of Sergeant First Class Eric Tempinski. She's in panic going, Doc, Doc, what do I do? Eric's hanging in the garage. That's when I said something better had to be done. Eric tipped the scales. I've lost more to suicide than multiple combat tours. This asked me to ask, what can be done? Build a safe, secure place where veterans can come for a day, a weekend, a week, a month, all the way up to the year, a year, and get the help they need. 2018, Project Die Hard was formed. The name, everybody asks, Project, we're always working. It's a project, we're always working. Die Hard comes from my time with the 1st Infantry Division, 1st Engineer Battalion, the Die Hard Battalion. No mission too difficult, no sacrifice too great, duty first. We started to raise funds for 120 acres in Livingston County to build Fort Hope, our national headquarters. 
2019, we just got our feet under us. We just started getting going. And then you all know what happened, right? Good old 2020. But during that time, the VFW magazine did an article on me and the mission under their still serving campaign that led to WSIL TV to do a news story on us. That put us in touch with another organization that said, hey, what could you do with 20 acres in a 10,000 square foot building? Bob Rush is located in McCanda, Illinois. It's named Bob Rush after Sergeant Courtney Rush of the United States Air Force from Illinois. She lost her fight to the demons January 2nd, 2012. This is how we name our facilities. Because we will not let people forget. So why support us right now? Because in order to build Fort Hope, we got to take this blessing we got, develop it, put plans and policies, everything in place. Funding is an ongoing battle. Our aim is to have 90% of all funds go directly to facility operations, i.e. providing hope, giving them and only 10% going to administrative costs. Are we there yet? Not even close. In fact, <clears throat> I don't receive a salary and about 90% of operating costs right now comes from my pension. With Fob Rush, we're still opening up to any veteran every, anywhere. So we're in Paducah, but I'm three miles from Illinois. Veterans can come. I don't care where they're from. If they need help, we're here. But our facilities, once we get them operational, bus run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Between Project Die Hard, Fort Hope, and Fire Brush, we're going to be bringing 75 full-time and 28 part-time jobs. Representative, you were saying in the nonprofit world, finding them people, I got them. They volunteer. I just need to pay them so I can really use them. But I got to remind you, we work with the blessings that we receive. Senator Angel over there, or who asked about how much? $10 million. Gets Bob Rush completed, Fort Hope built, and operating for two years. By that time, people will know we're real. We don't spend $10.2 million on a Super Bowl commercial. Discovered that. We give back. We hire veterans and local businesses. We partner with other veteran nonprofits. We have equine therapy, canine services, counseling, skill training, and everything all lined up. How'd that old movie go? If you build it, they will come? Oh yeah, we're on it. In conclusion, better must be done to support my brothers and sisters, those who served this country. We have to remove the stigma of suicide. We don't say the word commit, they died by. Because we gotta remove that stigma so people understand. When we talk about the number, Look, the VA reports, some states report, some don't, but the VA doesn't determine cause of death. And I understand why the local coroner, medical examiner says, ooh, that was an accidental overdose or it was a car accident because they're trying to save the family benefits because if it's a suicide, you take it away. Anybody that gives to us has the right to come and visit any facility, request our financials to see where your blessing goes. But my caveat to that is bring work gloves and muck boots because there is work to be done. Thank you and God bless for your time. If you have any questions, that's what I'm here to answer. 
We appreciate your testimony and, and your enthusiasm and also your service for uh, so many years that you've given our country so we can be here. Uh, members, do we have any questions or so? That's a tall ask, but... Uh, but well, sir, if you don't ask, well, that's, that's it's an automatic point. no. And that's, that's a good point. All right. I know it's uh, past lunchtime and, and we're getting towards and we still have a couple more. Thank you so much, Brian. Appreciate everything. And uh, we will go ahead and bring up our next uh, prevent uh, veteran suicide, Michael Stunovich. Was anywhere close? And Larry Arnett. <laughs> Very good. Introduce yourself so you can see how badly I slaughtered your name there. <laughs> Last name, I'm sorry. My name is Michael Stoyanovich. i a 26-year Army retiree and a member of the uh, State Executive Committee for Disabled American Veterans. Uh, Department of Kentucky. Larry, you want to introduce yourself to? We all know you, but go ahead. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. My name is Larry Arnett. I serve as the legislative chairman for the Joint Executive Council of Veteran Organizations of Kentucky. I'm not sure your mic's on, but, but just in case there. Was the green light on? Ah, now we got there it. There we go. Thank you. I was Larry Arnett. I am the Legislative Chairman for the Joint Executive Council of Veteran Organizations of Kentucky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, gentlemen, please proceed. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I first of all want to thank you and the members of the VMAP Committee for this opportunity to uh, hopefully gain your support for a piece of legislation that I wrote to prevent veteran suicide in Kentucky. I'm uh, also a member of the governor's challenge team and I have been since 2020. Um, we recently received some statistics from the University of Kentucky uh, School of Public Health and I'd like to read those to you. They're rather alarming. This, uh, these statistics came through the chairman of the Kentucky Governor Suicide Prevention. So I'll read them to you. These, uh, these are Kentucky resident suicides by military status, which means active duty or veterans or both from 2017 to 2021. 2017, 124 veterans took their own lives. 2018, 126 veterans took their lives. 2019, 103 veterans took their lives. 2020, 125 veterans took their lives. And in 2021, when the uh, study was completed, 111 veterans took their lives. I'm also a state service officer for uh, DAV, Department of Kentucky, and have been for years. I've interviewed thousands of veterans for uh, their claims, to file claims with Veterans Affairs, face-to-face -face interviews. Um, I've done hundreds, filed hundreds of claims for veterans for PTSD. Yes, I, I have been diagnosed with PTSD myself and been treated by VA for years. The most difficult thing to do face-to-face -face with veterans when, when you're trying, particularly for PTSD condition, I recognize uh, the condition almost immediately after asking just a few questions. And it, it's heartfelt. It's, it's hard for me to ask these questions, and I have to find out what incidents cause their PTSD. And it has to be one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. It's very difficult. 
and sometimes it takes weeks before they'll even let me know what those incidents were that may have caused her PTSD. Recently, uh, I live in Brownsville, which south of here, population about 700. I had a veteran to live there uh, when needed help for probably years with PTSD. He was an Iraqi uh, veteran, Iraqi war veteran. I filed a claim for him, make a long story short, it was approved for 70% for PTSD and 20% more for associated conditions to PTSD. So he had 90% uh, service connection disability. He didn't make it. He committed suicide at home after several years of treatment at VA. And the person who found him was his wife and three children less than 10 years old. Um, that one hits home. I see I've done hundreds of these claims and uh, it's taken its toll on me on occasion as well. I wanted to share that with you. Uh, as far as the reason I'm here is to gain your support for a piece of legislation that I've drafted. I've passed it on to, to a state senator uh, unfortunately, with the short session this year, I wasn't able to get onto the floor for any kind of a vote. But I, I would appreciate you being able to look at, I, I believe you all may have copies of the draft that I've written. It's a simply written draft by a, a simple man. It's about a page and a half typed. And what it, I'd like to read just a couple of highlights from the draft bill. Section one is the title, this act may be known as the Kentucky Veterans Bill of Rights to Prevent Veteran Suicide. Section two, the purpose, to help strengthen and coordinate proven suicide prevention programs and connect more veterans and their families, which is gravely important, to mental health services. The department partners, the department now, I wasn't able, I'm not able to uh, fix a lead agency or organization that would execute this particular lead piece of legislation. So I wrote department in as, as a qualifier or a base. The department partners with mental health providers and advocates to prevent veteran suicide and increase veterans' access to mental health services. The department connects veterans to train mental health care providers, including those trained in veteran suicide prevention, and create centralized provider database, which is very important for this piece of legislation, identifying by region mental health providers with expertise and ability to assess veterans and their families, including to highlight providers with training or experience in the prevention and treatment of veteran suicide. Now, partnerships, whoever is the department that will be the lead agency for this or lead organization um, has to forge partnerships faith-based faith partnerships, uh, professionals willing to donate time, psychologists, psychiatrists, prevent, put a database together of providers in this bill. I think what this may do would be the base source of these partnerships I think this piece of legislation can bring all these together because to coin a phrase from someone else, it takes a village. And I believe in this case, it does. This is a travesty that's gone on too long, veterans prevent, veterans suicide. Is this going to be a do-all, end-all, this piece of legislation? I don't know. 
but it might be the base piece that brings all this together. So I'd appreciate your reviewing this particular draft and do with what you may, whether it's mine or someone else's piece of legislation that they wrote, <clears throat> that's the most important, that it gets a chance. We, I don't believe we have anything like this. That's all I have to say, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I do apologize. I'm not sure we did get that in time to get it in your packet, so I know some of y'all were looking for that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to mention, too, for uh, Bill and Matt, because I see y'all are still back there, too. Any of that follow-up information, if you could get that to Jessica or Logan, through, and then they can send it out to all committee members. And same same with you, too, if you want to send a you know copy of the bill, and, and I'm not sure who carried it. Uh, Representative Bojanowski, were you look, is that the bill from last year? Or? Uh, I found HB I did send it to your staff yesterday. Yeah, and, and that unfortunately and that was too to tight of a window to get it in our packets. Uh, but sure. uh, but if if it's already here, we'll go ahead and try to send it out to all members there. So uh, we'll go ahead and do that. Thank uh, you, Larry. Did you have anything you wanted to yes, sir. mention, uh, Mr. Chairman? Thank you very much. I I have a brief uh, a brief comment here. I'm I'm proud to uh, to sit here beside uh, my friend uh, Michael Stoyanovich. Uh, he is a former chairman of the Joint Executive Council of Veteran Organizations. He is a longtime supporter of uh, veteran suicide prevention and has been uh, a tremendous advocate uh, for that. Uh, uh, you may not also know the fact that he is the primary person that was in charge of the uh, Green Alert uh, bill that you all passed just a few sessions ago uh, that is also helping uh, uh, veterans. So uh, Mike, has, uh, his heart's in the right place, his head's in the right place. This is a good start, and it is uh, time, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the committee in both chambers to take a very serious look. And on behalf of the 26 veteran or service organizations who are members of JECVO, let me just say up front, we thank you for bringing this issue to the forefront today. You're getting a, a good amount of information, but more important for us is that it shows that you see that it is important. It is a very important uh, issue for our veteran service organizations and the 295,000 veterans and the families that are out there dealing with this. Mike and all of the other presenters have given you some statistics. Every one of those impacted someone in a negative way. It comes from the heart when we do something about it. If the General Assembly, uh, in your wisdom, would come forth with a substantial piece of legislation dealing with sui veteran suicide prevention, I am confident that JECFO and the 26 veteran service organizations that are members of our organizations, we will be strongly behind you with that piece of legislation. And so we encourage you to continue to do that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We do have a question, uh, uh, Representative Stevenson. A more comment, Chair. Comment would be fine. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for all that you do for veterans. I myself served 27 years in the Air Force. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to hold us accountable. We can pass legislation. If we don't pass this legislation to stop veterans from killing themselves, then all we've done is made it a bumper sticker. Yes. We support veterans. And my, question, my request is, I know you're trying to be respectful, but everyone here has said they believe in what you said. All the everyone that's testified. Now it's time for you to call us and say, where is the legislation? We've proven we can get something done in an hour on the floor. Yes. Let's get this done in an hour on the floor. Here, Thank, here. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have uh, all the, the, the members will get a copy of what you've presented. Uh, we'll have that sent out. So if any of y'all 
want to work uh, uh, with uh, Mike, you sure can, and uh, trying to get uh, legislation crafted or so. But we appreciate y'all. Y'all's time and being here. We are getting late in the hour. We have one more presenter, uh, Chekovet, uh, Michael Carmichael. Y'all want to come up? And I see Logan hidden down there, so I'm assuming there's some slides attached again there. So yes, Mr. Chairman. Give him just a sec to load those up for you. Work the video and everything. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, I'm here to tell you today how we can actually prevent veteran suicide. I hope that that's got your attention. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Just for our record, Winley, introduce yourself if you would. So my name is Michael Carmichael. I'm a CW4 retired out of 5th Special Forces Group. So I had the honor of starting my military career in Fort Knox, basic and AIT. I was 17 years old as a junior in high school, and I had the honor of ending my career after 18 years straight serving 5th Special Forces Group. Uh, I had a combined total of 11 tours in combat. I say my commanders let me do that because without their faith and confidence, I wouldn't have been able to do that and lead men into combat. Next slide. So that's me. Here's our mission statement. Chekovet will prevent veteran suicide by raising public awareness and calling upon Americans, citizens, to meaningfully and routinely engage veterans. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to build a base of support around our veterans. That's our families, our neighbors, our friends, and our fellow veterans. Who's on our team? The first guy to join my team was the Honorable Mr. Secretary Christopher Miller, who was President Trump's last Secretary of Defense. Didn't hurt that 20 years ago he was my boss, and thankfully he still had a little love and respect for me. But actually he was the first person to jump onto our board. Next. The second person was, I needed some subject matter experts on suicide prevention and mental health. This is psychiatric nurse practitioner Faye Run. She's in Ohio. Next slide. To help us with our, our books and our uh, administrative uh, Tasks. I got Dave Wilson. He is a former commander and current regional commander of the VFW, and I also have the support of the American Legion. Next slide. Keys to success. We got to do a couple of things at the same time. The state has to have our efforts, your efforts. Next slide. But also, for success, we have to get better in suicide prevention down on the community level. Next slide. One more. Our program is really three pronged at the national and regional level. We have to raise awareness of veteran suicide. I guarantee you, I'm going to show you things in this briefing that you haven't seen today or you haven't seen ever to raise awareness. The second thing we have to do is call upon Americans. We have to call upon the citizens of Kentucky and neighbors and friends to have a meaningful and routine relationship with the veterans in their lives. That's going to build a base of support that's 24-7, 365. It's the base of support that our veterans need in that time of need for that phone a friend, for that uh, crisis management. Next. At the community, this is going to be the first of its kind. We're building a proof of concept right now in Callaway, Trigg, and Graves County. We'll get into this later, but uh, as we talk about our peer-to-peer -peer support groups, I'd like to point out that nowhere is a free peer-to-peer -peer support group for veterans and their family members and people who are trying to help them, not only with the struggles of suicide, with, with the struggles of life and the camaraderie that we all need as veterans. Next. So raise awareness. Go ahead. We're going to talk about how many. That'll be a lesson learned. We're going to talk about who they are, where they're at, and when they're doing it. Next. So this is the first piece that uh, I produced with the assistance of uh, Secretary Miller, and I titled it, What is Your Veteran Suicide? 
this needs to be an attention getter because people failed at this so miserably as I would ask these questions uh, to my friends and neighbors that I had to make this piece. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. How much do you know about veteran suicide? I'm Chris Miller, former acting secretary of defense, but more importantly, army veteran. And I would like to see how much or little you actually know about veteran suicide. Please watch the following clip and find out what your veteran suicide IQ is. Brought to you by Check Event. Anybody catch that number? Is it 30,177? We'll talk about that in just a minute. No, it was not. Slide. So if you Google search, that's the number that you're going to come up with, 30,177. On Memorial Day, I was actually on Fox News. They published my op-ed. And I was so happy to finally make it onto Fox News. But then I was so angry that this is the number that they used over the top of my op-ed. And as the first thing I'm trying to do is raise awareness to veteran suicide, the first thing you have to do is define the scope of the problem. How bad is it? So for some producer on Fox News just to Google it and then post that as the fact, it's tragic. If we're not talking about veteran suicide like we are here today, then there's not a problem. So I'd like to thank you. and We'll continue on with this. So, hold it right there. Does the VA have a number? Is the, is the number published anywhere? It took me 18 months to actually find the number. But the VA does have a number. It's in Appendix 508, and it's buried under about five layers of web pages that I can't even find every time I go to look for it. It takes me about five to ten minutes. It's difficult to find. So, what is the number? We just saw it in the video. Are you kidding me right now? <laughs> Say again. 127,560. Yes, ma'am. That's not through today. That is through 2020. By the time that the VA's suicide prevention report comes out, these numbers are already two years old. This is as of 2020. Next slide. Is that the extent of the problem? Are there other factors that are actually playing into veteran suicide? Yeah, big time. We're going to talk about Operation Deep Dive. Operation Deep Dive was actually uh, by the American Warrior Partnership on a $3.5 million grant from Bristol Myers Squibb, which is kind of interesting because I would think that they would be more interested in selling more uh, medicines than, than they are preventing veteran suicide. But it was very generous. Um, AWP did something brilliant in that they kept their hands clean of the study. They hired the University of Alabama to collect all the information and Duke University. This study was over five years in eight different states. In my opinion, born and raised in Montana, the most thoughtful state that AWP used in the study was Montana because it had been number one for the last 18 years and is currently number two. So, what they found is the VA's numbers are underreported by a factor of 2.4. So that just turned 127,000 into 306. They attribute most of those deaths 
to overdose. Overdose is classified in mortician and medical examiner's reports, UCD-10 codes, as a self-inflicted mortality. It doesn't matter if somebody was trying to get high according to their blood levels or if they were swinging for the fence trying to check out. It's not counted as a suicide. Was there constraints with deep dive? Yeah. They didn't have the social security numbers that the VA had, nor would the VA share with them. Not only that, some of the states actually tried to charge them up to $16,000 for one serial number to, to do this study. But the most tragic missing part in deep dive is the study couldn't include veterans who were over 65 years old. Veterans over 65 years old actually account for more than 40% of veteran suicide. It had to be excluded because the DOD had poor record keeping from 1973 and beyond. Next slide. So if we consider these two things, and this is just a hypothetical number as I project uh, the 40% extra of veterans 65 and over, this could be a very close number to our tragedy. Are you kidding me? 377,000. Next slide. Who are they? Where are they? How are they doing it? Is there a special circumstance? White veterans account for 87 percent. White veterans make up about five times more of a demographic than any other veterans uh, currently in the DOD or the VA system. Very ironically to me, black veterans are only at six percent, which is less than half of the nation's average of 13.5 percent for 2020, according to the CDC. So I want to know what that community is doing right and learn from that and, and help all of us do better. Male veterans account for 96% of veteran suicides. Wow. 35 and over, there was, there was a mention earlier, 18 to 34, but veterans 35 and over actually account for 86% of veteran suicides. As, as I mentioned before, 65 and over 40%. That is a split. It's not listed anywhere in the VA's information because it's a split from uh, the last two categories of age. Where are they doing it? They're doing it in rural areas. So we're talking older white veterans in rural areas. Kind of sounds like Kentucky to me. Next slide. How are they doing it? This, this is a point of much controversy, but the facts are the facts. Next slide. 66% of suicides are, are by firearms. Do firearms cause suicide? No. I sleep with a gun beside my bed every night. So far, it hasn't jumped up and hurt me. Um, there are, I study suicide on the world level through the World Health Organization. I've dedicated my life to this through the CDC and SAMHSA. I say I take these lessons learned and I wrap the camouflage around it. And with regards to firearms, when somebody decides to hurt themselves, firearms is just a convenient mode. The worst state in the nation right now for veteran suicide is Wyoming. I bring that up because their rate is 81%. So what if I could tell you of a population that is coast to coast with a higher rate of suicide than the worst state in the nation for veteran suicide? Their rate is 90, and I can guarantee you not one of them was done with a gun. The population that I'm talking about is the incarcerated population of America. It goes to show that once somebody decides to hurt themselves, it's just a matter of how they're going to get it done. Special circumstance. Two years ago, we saw something that we had never seen. The VA's vernacular had always been, more veterans end their life by suicide that are outside of the VA's healthcare system than inside. Two years ago, that's the first time we saw a flip where veterans who are in the VA healthcare system outnumbered those outside. So their narrative kind of changed when that happened. 
Then their narrative became, well, we've got the harder case veterans. I guess I would have to come up with something as well. Um, next slide. Call to action. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to figure out how to get people involved in veterans' lives. People all learn in different ways. Some, some it's an easy learn. Some you might have to startle them. Some uh, show them what right looks like. So we've prepared a couple of call to action videos uh, so that you can help or so that I can help you understand some of the work in this one category that Chekovet's doing. We have a few members that have a one o'clock meeting too, so so that's why you're seeing people. I'm going as fast as I can, sir. <laughs> that's fine. Simple call to action. Every one of us, if we do our part and we understand what, what our risk and protective factors are, we can actually make a difference in veteran suicide. Pay attention. This was actually the very first public service announcement I, I wrote. I was hoping for uh, somebody more famous to, to star in it, but the impact of this goes to show that veteran suicide can happen to anybody. Go ahead. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Can I have a minute of your time? Absolutely. My name is Michael Carmichael. I'm the president of Chekhovet. Do you happen to have a veteran in your life? Proud to say I do, my son, Paul, or as his buddies like to call him, Carter. Yeah. His name's Bob Goodall, and we met him at church. We do? Yeah, we do. Our neighbor, Chris. Well, he, they call him Tanner, but yeah. Could you tell me a little bit about Carter's service? Happy to. Well, he listed in the Army, and uh, he made it all the way to sergeant, and proud to say he was also a Green Beret. Yes, he was a Master Chief, and he retired after 30 years of service wow. in the Navy. He was a Marine. Well, he is a Marine. You know, they say once a Marine, always a Marine. And uh, yeah, I know he was in the service for quite a while. Can you guys tell me anything about how his transition out of the Marine Corps went? He's had a hard time finding employment. It's been a little rough for him. His uh, wife recently left with the children and went to mm. go live with her mom. So mm. he's not been doing well with that actually, so. I believe it went really well. He got lucky and right when he got out, he got a job with local weather station. Taking life with the same fire he had in the military. He's getting a master's in civil engineering. Rather, he majored in business so he can come <laughs> work with me, but you know how that goes. He's got an amazing wife, gave me two amazing grandkids and, uh, He's just doing amazing. It's great. Would it be okay if I asked you guys a difficult question about Bob? Yeah. Do you think Bob would ever hurt himself? No. I don't believe so. No. Yeah, it's not Bob. Do you think Tanner would ever hurt himself? Yeah, he's been having a very hard time. Extremely stressed out, you know, hasn't been easy. I would really hate to think about something like that, but it's a very tough question. Yeah. Tanner's been having a very hard time, but I, I know him, I know he's very resilient, so I think it's gonna be okay. Would it be okay if I asked you a difficult question? Shoot. Do you think Carter would ever hurt himself? Absolutely not. He's just not wired that way. He's not that kind of guy. He's the, he's the kind of guy that lifts other people up. He's definitely not the kind of guy that would do something like that.
if we don't pay attention, we won't see it coming. If we don't decide to educate ourselves on what suicide risk factors look like, we won't see it coming. If we don't decide to educate ourselves on what you should do if your veteran is in immediate crisis and might hurt themselves, this could happen. How many people are susceptible to suicide? In this piece, we looked at, for each suicide, the correlation to other stressors that might bring somebody to suicide. Thankfully, this is a short video. So for each suicide, in the video it says 275 people seriously consider ending their life. Some of the most valuable lessons learned that I've had as I study suicide is from survivors of suicide, people who actually attempted to end their life and survived. So sometime that impulsive act if you say you're one of those 275, once that impulsive act engages the gears to suicide, they spend between five and 20 minutes deciding to do it and executing their plan. This could attribute why firearms is over 60%. Thanks. Uh, the, the the next slide, the next video here. Uh, I hope I hope you guys have seen it. It was released on Memorial Day weekend. It's of a veteran who's extremely stressed out. He's sitting in his car in the parking lot of the VA, and he's he's lamenting about continuity of care. He's lamenting about having to retell his story over and over again. He's lamenting about his medications and unavailability of all of those things. Our approach in calling to action Americans, citizens of Kentucky and our towns, builds a base of support for veterans just like that so that they have a 24-7 network so that when they struggle, they, can, they have somebody to call. They don't need to retell their story. They don't need to wait for weeks and months to get a, an appointment. It's readily available. It's next door. Slide. Do you know what to do? If you walked in a room and your, your veteran was going to hurt himself, you can go to checkavet.org and find it. We're not writing this stuff. I, I capture it from other websites that I find to be credible, engaging, and, uh, and uh, realistic. So, Please go to checkabet.org and you can you can you can see all of these ex, uh, education pieces. <coughs> suicide safety plan. That's the Brown suicide safety plan. It's a real thing. It's right there where everybody can use it. Engagement strategies. Um, some of the speakers today have talked about how they engage the veterans in their lives. They're doing the right thing. I get people who approach me all the time as I'm at NASCAR events. Sturgis, the biggest cat, the biggest fish fry in, in America, the likes. I get approached by people who want to do the right thing by the way of their veterans, but they don't know how to approach them. They don't know how to engage them. Go to checkabet.org. See what we have listed there to give you an idea how to engage your veteran. You got to start simple. And this is how I got started. What made a difference for me as I got out of the Army to 
put it into context, 26 years in the Army, 22 of those as a Green Beret and a Ranger. Near the end of my career, I was pulled out of the Army, given a blue, blue badge, and I went to work for the CIA as a case officer. After that, I was putting a dent into my bed. I isolated myself. I was depressed. What made a difference for me? It was my neighbors. They decided to check on their veteran. They came over and they replaced isolation with companionship. Pull back the camouflage. They replaced isolation with fellowship. That's what made a difference. Start simple. Get involved with your veterans. We have to learn the subtle signs of, of veteran suicide or potential suicide. There's lots of them, and these are uh, suicide risk factors, and these are things that can very subtly be communicated because the fact of the matter is most people who are considering hurting themselves tip their hands. So let's all learn how to recognize those signs and symptoms. This is where it's at. And I want to really applaud uh, Care USA. This is, this is their approach too. If we get after the suicide risk factors, we identify what they are, try to intervene in our veterans' lives before it comes to the end, and strategize how to replace risk with protective, not only are you going to uplift that veteran, you could potentially end, end their demise. We talk about this team of Chekavet. We talk about our approach and strategies as the key. It was briefly mentioned earlier that the lock that the key needs to open is the veterans themselves. They have to be open to this. You have to be uh, willing to know that it's okay to not be okay. For 26 years in the Army, all I knew was take the mountain, you know, go do come back when it's done. I, I didn't have time to complain about it or raise a hand, say, I'm hurt or I need whatever. Those times are past. Let's learn from the mistakes of the past. Let's not only talk about it, let's really believe and share with our veterans that it's okay to not be okay. And when you feel like you're not okay, I'm here to help you. So. Oh, this is a good one. Miss and misconceptions. Old versus young. I already tipped my hand earlier. Older veterans count for the majority of suicides by far. Combat versus non-combat. This was one of the most interesting things for me to learn in my study of suicide. This was the only study that I've ever seen the medical uh, community do that didn't have a control group really didn't have much of a scientific uh, approach at all. They had a thesis, and then they looked to the data to prove the thesis. Their thesis was, well, it's got to be combat veterans. But what the data showed them was there's no correlation at all. Next slide. What's the worst time of year? I had always heard that it's the holiday season. What's the data say? It's actually spring. It's upon us. Next slide. Are all suicides product of mental illness? Nope. They're not. You have a mental illness if you're diagnosed with something. If you exhibit signs and symptoms of a mental illness. A lot of veterans, a lot of people, this isn't just for veterans, this is for people, okay? If they, if they unexpectedly end their life by suicide, that does not buy them a diagnosis of mental illness, okay? Mental illness does not always drive the train on suicide. This leads me to the administration's priorities to prevent veteran suicide. We all talk about lethal means safety. That's the number one thing. In my opinion, and that's one of my favorite things to say because whatever comes after is never wrong, at least to me. In my opinion, that's like jumping out of an airplane with your parachute standing on top of a ladder right before the ground. You're never going to be able to make it to that. If your method of 
preventing suicide is lock up guns. One, you've completely lost your audience of veterans. It's part of our culture. But two, we need upstream education and engagement so that we never even get to the suicide. I hope that that makes sense. I'll say it again. We have to be upstream. We have to do the things that we're talking about here. His second priority is enhanced crisis care. So once they hurt themselves, we'll have a better chance of saving them. Um, the fourth thing is actually where I think the first thing should be. Um, and then increased coordination, data sharing, and evaluation. That's what we try to do from the very beginning. I hope that I accomplished some of that as I started speaking and raising awareness to veteran suicide. This is the first of its kind anywhere for free. We're going to build a peer-to-peer -peer support group for veterans and their family members. What makes Checkavet unique is veterans aren't our key targeted demographic. It's the base of support. It's the family. It's the friends. That way we can enhance what the VA is doing with what the veterans need, and that's a web around them of love, support, and understanding. The only, in the region, there's one peer-to-peer -peer support group, and that's a cornerstone in Clarksville, Tennessee. The problem with that is they build the insurance and the capacity is, is very small. Next slide. So for family members, we want, a, we want a meeting that looks like al -Anon. And that's to put tools in toolboxes, provide education, shared experiences, and help each other to do a better job at engaging and protecting our veterans. So, what's the cost to develop this? Chekovet just submitted a Staff Sergeant Fox grant through the VA. The most you can ask, ask for is 750000 We tried to be very fiscally responsible, which I hope resonates in this room. And we just support, we submitted a plan for 600000 I'm going to be brutally honest with you guys right now. I don't want the VA's money. Because with the VA's money comes the VA's constraints. And I think that those constraints will doom the plan to fail before we can ever show how effective a peer-to-peer -peer support group will be. It's like... The other problem with the, the Staff Sergeant Fox Grant is it's not even for a whole year. It's only for 10 months. we got to build this thing for a year. There's a misconception that because veteran suicide reported data is two years old by the time you see it, it would take three to five years to actually see an effect, a palpable effect of your program on suicide. It's not true. We have access to veteran suicide crisis line data. We have access to county and state level veteran suicide data. I suggest we can start seeing our, uh, uh, the result of our efforts after the first year. Next slide. Once we build it, I want this to be just like Alcoholics Anonymous. Sure, for the first few years, there's going to be overhead to collect the data, analyze it, and improve, and improve the program. But... When's the last time you, you saw a major effort that's only going to cost $900,000? Proof of concept. This is going to be for a veteran base of 5,000 in Callaway County, Trigg County, and Graves County, Kentucky. Everything we're raising is in Kentucky. We're a nationwide nonprofit. I live in Murray. My heart's in Murray. And my efforts are in Kentucky. keys to success. We all have to work together, both as a state, as the communities, as neighbors, friends, and people who care about even a veteran who's a stranger. We need to get back to the days of World War I and World War II, when the American citizenry loved their veterans so much that back then, the suicide rate of veterans was actually less than the civilian rate. Get back to loving your veterans. It's going to make a difference. Go ahead.
How good's Kentucky doing? Ouch. We're the 11th worst state in the nation. Let's do better. I hope you guys want to work with Chekhovet. I hope we can get support from the state. Everything we want to do with this peer-to-peer support group is for Kentucky. I want Kentucky to lead the way in the nation. Show America what right looks like. Then they can have the program too. I don't even frankly care if you put check of that on it. Let's build a program that works. Spread it across the state. Share it with the nation. Question. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Members, any questions or so? You know, what we're seeing is is quite a few great organizations out there that are needing a little bit of funding. So so maybe that is the case where where we put together a group and, and look at at how we do this. You know, we, there's some great organizations that are in this community or in this room. And there's probably others across the state that we're not even seeing right now. So uh, uh, Representative Johnson had a had a good idea is, is let's try to funnel this and and uh, sometimes instead of line items in the budget it works better if we can put a pool of money that groups could draw through so draw for so we'll we'll see what we can do on that um we do have a uh, question real quick uh representative lafferty very briefly i want to say thank you of course thanks to everyone here today appreciate everything that you do for our veterans and I'll try to be brief I want to applaud you first of all for saying that you don't want the VA's money that you don't want the veterans money um, do you work with local uh, local veterans service organizations absolutely and I, I actually receive my health care from the VA okay um, because I know those are very important especially in our rural areas and um, you know I've even spoken I've already spoken with um, I want to also applaud you on your uh, encouragement to engage our veterans recently I went to a Memorial Day service where um, our veterans were there playing taps and and my six-year-old I'm not sure who was more excited uh, my six-year-old to see the presentation um, or whether they were excited to see how excited he was to see the presentation and after that I spoke to some of our military veterans who told me that they're volunteering to be there there's no payment for gas um, their dress uniforms Um, you know I know that we provide for funeral services when they play taps and things of that nature Um, and of course those also need to be increased when you take into account the price of gas and things that have increased lately but if we want our veterans to keep participating i think it's important that everyone realize that when they attend these events a lot of times they're depending upon donations from the community to to get these veterans out get them in a vehicle and transport them to and from and i think that we should appreciate that and i just hope that uh, i wasn't aware and i just like for everyone else to be aware that sometimes these veterans organizations um they do it on a volunteer basis so yes, thank ma'am. you thank you we appreciate Charles' testimony and everyone else's that's still in the room here. I know the meeting's gone a little long, but this is a topic I didn't want to cut short. I mean, this is something that it deserves plenty of time, and, and uh, thank goodness we, uh, we, we have, have you all fighting for it, and, and hopefully we can get in that fight also. Members, there is uh, a administrative regulation in your packet. If you all have any questions or any issues with it or anything like that, as you know, once we pass laws, regulations kind of lay the the groundwork and the intricacies of some of our laws. But uh, if you have any questions, uh, holler at Jessica or Logan, and uh, we'll we'll address them. Is there any other, anything else before the committee? Well, we appreciate it. I think July twenty fourth might be our next meeting i think that was it y'all know thanks and uh, if there's no other business we stand adjourned